Welcome to Physics Next Book. In this video, we shall go over the idea of velocity dependent mass or relativistic mass, what it is, how it differs from the standard or ordinary mass, and where does the idea of a relativistic mass come from. And finally, why some say relativistic mass is a term that I think should be banned from everyone's vocabulary. What? And I kind of agree with him. Let me explain why. To define the relativistic mass of an object, first we need to specify what we mean by its rest mass. Physically, mass of an object is the amount of matter contained in it, a fairly common concept understood by all. The rest mass is a bit formal though, defined to be the mass measured specifically by an observer who is in the object's rest frame. So practically, rest mass is no different than the mass I refer to when in a marketplace asking for 1 kilo potato and the shop owner weighs and gives me 1 kilo potato. 1 kilo is the rest mass here because neither me the buyer nor he the seller is moving with respect to the potato pile. So with that settled, the relativistic mass or velocity dependent mass is the rest mass times the Lorentz factor. What is this Lorentz factor? Where does it come from? Its physical significance? Covered. All have been covered in an earlier video. Link is in the description, like always. For now, all we need to know is the value of this Lorentz factor varies with the relative speed or velocity. Whose speed or velocity are we talking about? Depends on the perspective we choose to go with. From the object's perspective, it is the velocity of a moving observer. From the observer's perspective, it is the velocity of the moving object. It's uh, relative, right? The best way to avoid any confusion is to state that it is the relative velocity between the object whose mass is to be measured and the observer who carries out the measurement. Okay, fine. But why do we need the relativistic mass? Under what scenario really? Have you ever seen a shop owner measuring the mass of a moving potato pile? It's absurd, right? Moreover, imagine if by some magic the potatoes actually ran off, then the shop owner has to follow with his weighing machine. But that means he is now moving along with the potatoes and have become the rest frame observer again. So there is no usual way of directly measuring the mass of a moving object. Does that mean we are in a fix? Not really. To obtain the mass of a moving object, an observer can measure its velocity by tracking its rate of change of position with time. Then he can make the object hit a target and then measuring how much force the object imparts on the target, its momentum can also be measured. According to the pre-relativistic Newtonian mechanics, the momentum vector p of the object is its mass times its velocity vector. So from the measured value of p and v vector, he can calculate the mass of the moving object. Which mass is this? Is it the rest mass or the new relativistic mass? Remember the 1 kilo potato? Yeah, that mass, the plain vanilla ordinary mass, which is the same as the rest mass as we have just discussed. Notice that the observer does not actually measure, rather he calculates the mass using a formula. But the issue is, this formula is not perfect. It works, but only when the object is moving with small velocities, something we experience in our day-to-day -day life. It happens to be the non-relativistic definition of momentum vector given by Sir Newton back in the days when Galilean relativity with no speed of light barrier on the massive object and a universal absolute time was in style. So the correct definition comes from Einstein's special relativity and works across the full range of allowed velocity values, right from a small non-zero value to all the way up to the near light speed. It is the relativistic version of this formula, which says the momentum vector equals the Lorentz factor times the rest mass times the velocity vector. Where do we get this relativistic definition of momentum vector? From four velocity and four momentum, specifically their spatial components, that is their three-dimensional vector parts. Let's take the four velocity first. It is a four vector, meaning under a Lorentz transformation, its change of components are consistent with the laws of special relativity. For details, check out my video on four vectors from the link in the description. Of course, four velocity has four components, the zeroth component is along the temporal direction or time direction. We do not need that in this video. The remaining three are in the three spatial directions. Together, 
they make a three dimensional vector let's say u vector now we need to be a bit careful here although this u vector is the three dimensional vector part of the four velocity but it is not exactly the three dimensional velocity vector v that we are all familiar with it is rather the lorentz factor gamma times the ordinary velocity vector v in a previous video we have shown this so let us not get into the details here you can check that out later again link is in the description now the four momentum is defined to be the rest mass times four velocity so its special part the three dimensional vector p is obviously the rest mass times the special part of the four velocity the u vector which as you can see gives us the proper relativistic definition of a three dimensional momentum vector because it comes directly from the relativistic definition of four momentum it is consistent with the laws of relativity and works for all velocity values permitted by special relativity so the special part of the four momentum four velocity relationship is the correct full fledged version of the mind definition of momentum vector we have been using in newtonian mechanics does this mean newton got it all wrong not really because this relativistic definition of the momentum vector boils down to his version for small velocities we can readily see this by checking how the value of the lorentz factor gamma changes as we increase beta or v by c that is the velocity in units of light speed this is a plot of the lorentz factor versus the relative velocity see that the lorentz factor is practically 1 until we are dealing with extremely high speeds like 40 to 50% of the speed of light and even at 60% gamma is just a notch bigger than 1 only beyond the 50 to 60% speed of light gamma really starts to grow like crazy and rapidly diverges to infinity so you see we can use the full relativistic definition of momentum vector technically for all velocity values but it makes a difference only at very high velocities like half the speed of light and beyond now let us go back to the observer who was trying to calculate the mass of a very high speed object by measuring its momentum and velocity he is unaware of the relativistic definition of momentum and uses the newtonian version instead so taking the momentum to velocity ratio will actually produce the value of gamma times the rest mass but in his ignorance he shall think of it as the measured value of mass of the moving object obviously if he repeats this exercise for different values of high velocity for example 1/3 or 1/2 or 2/3 the speed of light and so on the gamma factor will shoot up and he will conclude that the measured mass of the particle is increasing with increasing velocity and of course the concept of a velocity dependent mass will be the outcome of his experiment but you and i very well know where he slipped right the formula he is working with does not fit the bill here of course we cannot deny the fact that agreeing to make the gamma factor latch onto the rest mass and calling the whole thing a new mass the relativistic mass let's us keep the good old newtonian definition of momentum as mass times velocity and there are examples in physics where disguising a new formula to make it look like an old familiar one proved to be advantageous for example in this present case the relativistic mass comes in handy while solving collision problems or using the conservation of momentum law but the advantages sort of stop there job 3811 Here the two shall thou come but no further we should not rely on this idea of a relativistic mass beyond the context of solving classroom problems in mechanics why not because fundamentally nature follows the laws of relativity and quantum mechanics the non relativistic classical physics is mathematically easy to use and conceptually easier to understand but it is only an approximate theory applicable for low velocity motion of macroscopic objects so while constructing the fundamental theories that we hope describe the natural world we must use quantities that behave properly under lorentz transformation for example concepts like position velocity rest mass momentum acceleration force electric and magnetic fields gravitational field and so on there are so many all of them satisfy this criteria of a proper lorentz transformation meaning they are either a scalar or a three component vector maybe a four vector or a tensor or a component of a tensor and so on the relativistic mass is neither of these it is velocity dependent so if you go to a different inertial frame 
the relative velocity changes changing its value, thus clearly not a scalar. It neither has multiple components, so not a three-dimensional vector or a four vector or tensor. Neither does it feature as component of a vector or tensor anywhere. So you see, from the standpoint of Lorentz transformation, the relativistic mass is in a mess. On the contrary, the rest mass is an invariant or scalar by design. Do you see why? Because the answer to what is the rest mass of that moving object is not what the mass value observers in different inertial frames measure, but what the observers in its rest frame measure. A unique answer, objective in nature, that does not depend on the point of view of observers in different frames. So rest mass is a scalar by default, sometimes also referred to as the invariant mass, for example in the Wikipedia. So you see, we can use relativistic mass to solve rudimentary mechanics problems, but we should never take it too seriously to venture into new territories with it. Uh, what do we mean by new territories? See, dynamical variables like position and momentum, energy, etc. were ideas defined way back when physics was all classical. But we can do quantum mechanics with them. Someday we shall talk about that in details, but the point is, quantum mechanics is a new territory where these ideas still work and their behavior under the change of frame is well sorted. Another example, the action principle, Lagrangian, Hamiltonian, etc. We first learn about them in context of particle mechanics, but they continue to work well in classical field theories, even in quantum field theory. Again, new territories. These are examples of good ideas, not the relativistic mass. So that's my take. Comment and let me know your thoughts on it. You are probably thinking, if relativistic mass is not a sound concept, then how the heck are we supposed to explain why a massive object cannot reach the speed of light? We shall talk about that in the next video. Hope you enjoyed this one. Bye-bye.